what I mentioned is every patient has to be treated individually and appropriately for the condition for the insomnia and has to have an appropriate evaluation and that the use of Ativan orally can be appropriate for a very short period of time in dealing with secondary anxiety, secondary insomnia associated with anxiety, sorry. Uh, so now your position is that Ativan can be used for insomnia? Yes, Sustained has to be prefaced now. Okay, your position is that Ativan or lorazepam can be used for insomnia? I, I mentioned even earlier, I said it, it, it can be used in secondary insomnia, even though it's not FDA approved, for a very short-term basis. When you say it's not FDA approved, the, the description, the drug description that is contained in the PDR, do you know where that comes from? Overall. It comes from studies that have been done on the drug, uh, including you know safety monitoring and, and so forth. Well, it comes from the package insert. Correct. Isn't it? Right. Correct. And package inserts are approved by the D FDA, aren't they? They they normally are. Yes. They normally are. Yes. Okay. So when the package insert says it's useful. For insomnia, the FDA's really approved that, haven't they? There are medications that are used for secondary causes of insomnia. There's a, n another list of them. There's antidepressants that have sedating effects that that can be used to treat secondary insomnia when the insomnia is due to, for example, a depression, um, and it really targets both things. And I and, and that is the meaning. For primary insomnia, when you've ruled out all secondary causes, there is no role to the use of Ativan. I just want to be clear. You formed the opinion that Mr. Jackson was dehydrated when he was given the propofol and that would have been a complicating factor. Is that correct? Uh, those are based on uh, Dr. Mary's testimony, correct? Now, interview. interview, sorry. Uh, Dr. Murray's uh, interview indicated that he was treating him for dehydration, correct? Um, he indicated that he had a bag of saline uh, being infused, but uh, how much and how fast and how much fluids he was getting is unclear. And again, this points to the fact about charting and knowing what you're giving the patient, knowing how much of a, a particular therapy you're giving a patient. So um, th the only thing to answer your question was that there was a bag of saline being infused. That could mean that that bag of saline was being infused over 24 hours, or it could mean that it was being infused more rapidly. I don't have that information. Do you remember what the question was? Objection argumentative. Sustained. Dr. Murray indicated in his statement that he was treating Michael Jackson for dehydration, didn't he? He indicated that, yes. And he started that treatment when he put in an IV at 1.30, didn't he? Um, he, putting an IV does not, uh, is not treating dehydration putting in an IV and appropriately infusing fluids uh, as needed uh, is appropriate therapy for Did you form an opinion as to why Dr. Murray put in the IV based upon his statement? Um, he, he put an IV to administer medications that he was giving. Didn't he also say put the IV in for to hydrate? Mr. Jackson? That was in a statement as well. And that IV had been in for about nine hours? Objection vague. At what time? As of, as of 10.30? Maybe uh, uh, 10 hours as of 11.30? Sure, yes. And the IV bag had saline in it? That's, that's correct. Would that hydrate a patient? Uh, that's a very 
vague term. Uh, if somebody is very dehydrated, a bag of, they may need three bags of one liter of normal saline over a course of minutes. It, you know, the, the, it, you're, you're, I don't think you're doing justice here by the way you're describing this. It really, per, it, it really is an individual basis. If you, many patients that come in, let me give you an example. Any patient that comes into the hospital, they get an IV put on to them. That's not treating dehydration. It's just giving them some fluids back. Are they all dehydrated? No. It's how you are actually infusing the fluids, how rapidly, how you're assessing their response to the fluids and their dehydrated state that's important. The fact that there was just a bag of fluids being infused does not mean that that was appropriate therapy for dehydration. So his hydration therapy was inappropriate too? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I don't have enough information to know how much he was giving, at what rate he was giving, again, going to the problem of there being no records and no charting. Well, you stated that, that Michael Jackson was dehydrated. Per uh, Dr. Mary, yes. At what time was he dehydrated? When he... he, he, he Just a moment, please. Based upon what you read, you can answer. If not, let me know. I'm not exactly sure about the time. Okay. Now, if you were to look at it and see that Michael Jackson uh, produced a 450cc urine sample at 7.30 and at time of autopsy with a possible death time at 12 o'clock, he produced another 500 plus cc's. Would you be able to determine from that whether or not he was dehydrated? Um, I think that is insufficient uh, in and in of itself for me to make that determination. Okay. But he was producing urine, wasn't he? Um, he was. And he was producing it in fairly significant quantities, wasn't he? I don't have access to the information to know what he was producing on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. <laughs> So you don't know if he was dehydrated or not in the early, in the, in around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock? In the morning? A.M. I'm basing that information on um, the interview from Dr. Murray. Okay, and Dr. Murray didn't specify his level of hydration at any particular time other than his start time, did he? I'm not sure exactly what time he was referring to. He was just referring to the patient was dehydrated. And he didn't specify the level of dehydration that, that he had, did he? Well, no, he did not. Just indicated that he, he gets dehydrated when, when he performs. Correct. But if I may add... You've that, answered the question. No, that's all right. You, correct. If I may add know. when... No, that's all right. You don't have to. If, sure. if counsel wants to ask, we can get to that. So any uh, last comment about, if I may add, a stricken disregard? Mr. Flanagan. Now, we were discussing the, the, uh, the 25 milligrams of, of propofol infused over three to five minutes. Uh, how long would you expect that to cause sedation? Um, no longer than six to ten minutes in a patient that has not been on any other agents, like the patient you earlier had described who is an otherwise healthy patient on nothing else. So it would, you would expect it to be the sedation to last six to ten minutes? Correct. After which time you would not cons consider that patient to be sedated? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, the, the, every patient is different. You're asking me a general question. Every patient needs to be monitored and needs to be assessed to, as to whether the effects of the sedative have worn off. Okay. But your expectation of 25 milligrams over three to five minutes, he would not be sedated any longer than six to ten minutes. Um, can you be more specific about he, who you're referring to as he? Uh, this, Mr. Jackson. 
Okay, because before you were giving me a patient that, uh, just a hypothetical patient that wasn't well, on sedatives well, or wasn't receiving anything. Else. Use everything you know about Mr. Jackson. Let's assume we're talking about Mr. Jackson. And he was given 25 milligrams over three to five minutes. Would you expect him to be sedated longer than 10 minutes? Is the doctor assuming what Dr. Murray relayed about? I think that's the dilemma. I, I'm not so sure what the question asks for. Sustained. You indicated that you would expect 25 milligrams of propofol in a person 61 and 0.7 kilograms would last about somewhere between 6 and 10 minutes, correct? That's right. And after that, you would not expect there to be sedation, would you? In a patient that is not on other medications, does, yes. not, does not have other medications in their system. Right. Traditionally, yes, I would not expect them to have residual effects. And uh, if that, would you expect that patient to automatically wake up as soon as the propofol uh, sedation effects were over? I would expect them to gradually have increased uh, level of consciousness. Okay, would you, I mean, at, at the 10 minute mark, would you expect him? automatically open his eyes and get up. Um, I think every patient is different. Okay, and so it wouldn't be unusual for the patient to continue to sleep after sedation like that, would it? For, are you just referring to someone that just got propofol in and of itself? Yes. Um, no, I would expect that patient to wake up. Okay, and if the patient were tired, would it be unusual to see that pa patient continue to sleep? Um, in the capacity that I use propofol in, in my line of work, absolutely. I would expect them always to be awake if I was using propofol as I use propofol on a daily basis. I would not expect them to, to be asleep afterwards. I, that would be actually very troubling. In the event that they were tired and been trying to go to sleep for nine hours or ten hours, and they were extremely tired, would you expect them to continue to sleep? I think if I was using a drug for sedation, it is my obligation to assess whether that is sleep or the effects of sedation. So, you, you know, this is really imperative on the, the, the physician if I'm sedating someone and they stay as asleep, I have to make sure that it's not the effect of the sedative. So it, that, is, that is the responsibility of the, of the physician caring for the patient so you think to make that, that determination. You think once you've uh, sedated a place, patient, patient's gone to sleep, you, you should then wake them up? It, if somebody's gone to sleep, and if I've been sedating the patient with propofol, I would want to assess, yes, I want to assess if they are responsive to external stimuli. Absolutely. I have that obligation. I, I want to know if it's, if it's the effect of the drug or if it is them being asleep. I, if I was using that drug, that is my responsibility. Absolutely. But when we're talking about using this, what we previously described, a minor amount, you don't think you can rely upon that being either metabolized or redistributed after 10 minutes? I think the amount is not important. If you are bold enough to have the lack of judgment to use propofol in this setting, it is incumbent on you to make sure that it's not the effect of propofol and to keep monitoring the patient. Well, would you feel confident after 20 minutes that propofol was not the agent keeping the individual to sleep? I don't, I don't think time is a factor. I would make a, I would make a continuous assessment to, to really figure out uh, what is the underlying cause of the patient's um, diminished level of consciousness. And if I had been using a sedative, I want to first know if it's the sedative that is doing it. So it's your testimony that in evaluating the effects of propofol, time is not a factor. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if I am using propofol as a sedative 
and I have a patient that you're describing that, rem that I think the propofol should have worn off and they're still not responsive, it is my duty to figure out what is going on. Could it have been that this was some effect of other addit additive effect of propofol in addition to other medications? Could there be something going on? It is my duty to figure that out. And I think that is uh, something we, we always practice in medicine. We don't really just make judgments, well, a little bit of this is okay. If that is a medication that requires continuous monitoring and you're using it, you have to continue monitoring the patient. You can't make exceptions. And I think what you're alluding to is making an exception, saying, well, that drug should, should have worn off, it was a little dose. And what I'm saying is that patient should have been monitored and there should have been assessment made as to whether uh, that could have been the effect of the sedation. If the patient continued to sleep for an hour, would you be confident that there was no propofol well, causing the patient to sleep at that time? Sleep is, is different. I would say, as an answer to that, I would continue monitoring the patient vigilantly and making sure. I would want to make sure if that is sleep or if this is a depressed state of consciousness induced by a combination of, of medications. Okay. As you monitor that patient visually, do you think you can tell whether or not he is sleeping naturally or not? Excuse me? As you continue to monitor that patient visually, as you just described, will that enable you to tell whether or not that patient is sleeping naturally? I think the most important thing is if you are using a drug like propofol, and which I would never advocate, and we've discussed you know, that. Th this, uh, I, well, Your Honor, could, could you say? Well, I think, I think both are either a yes or no. So the objection sustained, the last answer stricken, disregard. You may re-ask your question. Listen carefully to the question. Sure. If you're able to answer it, yes or no, do so. If not, tell us. Mr. Flanagan. Do you think by visually monitoring the patient that you could determine whether or not that patient was sleeping naturally or not no that's a that's a that's a determination you can't make by just visually monitoring the patient and you need to assess and you need to see if that person is responsive to external stimuli so just by watching his breathing evaluating his pulse and his oxygen saturation it's your testimony that you and and after the passage of significant time, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or a half hour, it's your testimony that you would not be able to determine whether or not that patient was sleeping naturally. I think that you're asking this question in the context of this case. And in the context of this case, Mr. Jackson had received other agents that could have had an additive effect. And in this situation, no, I wouldn't have. I, I, I would have continued to be to, to monitor, and I would have, if I had that question, I would, have seen, I would have assessed whether the patient was responsive to external stimuli. So you'd awaken him up? I, I owed that to the patient if I, if I felt like it could have been due to the medication. That is my primary responsibility, is the well-being of the patient. And that's, that would include a patient that you've been spent, you spent the last nine hours trying to get to sleep. My obligation is to the well-being of the patient, not what the patient necessarily perceived as what's important to them. If I feel that I, that, that could do my patient more harm, if, if the potential of the sedative effects accumulating is more significant, absolutely I would do that. And does the patient's ability to sleep have anything to do with his well-being? I think that is, a, that is an issue that is more a chronic issue but we always have to prioritize in medicine. We have to deal with problems that could be more significant, and I would want to make sure that it was not something more significant here. So when Dr. Murray stated that he gave him the IV and proceeded to watch him until he was comfortable with the fact that he was sleeping, uh, you don't think Dr. Murray was capable of making that assessment? Um, no, I think that's a very difficult assessment to make in this circumstance. Okay. Now, 
do you think propofol should ever be used for conscious sedation? Um, you, you mean moderate sedation, is that correct? Conscious sedation. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, that is a term that's, you know, now, now more often we use the term moderate sedation where patients are still responsive uh, to, to stimuli, to uh, verbal stimuli. Um, I think there is a role in a very highly monitored setting, absolutely. Now, you referred to, on your report, you indicated that you determined that Mr. Jackson had, uh, I think you used the term, massive doses of deep sedatives. What does massive doses uh, mean? I suspect that uh, in addition to getting the uh, 25 milligrams, he likely uh, had a, a drip um, that was not uh, being infused via a precise pump where there was a, a, a precise mechanism to regulate how much was going in his system. So you think he had a drip? I think uh, if you read the notes um, from uh, Dr. Mary's interview on page 62 um, with uh, Detective Martinez, there is, uh, there, th when he asked them about how he used uh, propofol, he mentioned doing the push and then following it with a drip. Uh, you've, uh, you're referring to the same uh, paragraph that was referred to by Dr. Steinberg? Objection, calls for speculation. I'll overrule the objection if you know. I have no idea. I haven't listened to Dr. Steinberg's testimony. That's the answer. Okay. Uh, in citing us to page 62, you've read the transcript. Have you listened to the interview? Um, no, I have not. Just... You haven't heard the words as they were spoken by Dr. Murray? No, I just, uh, Mr. Walgren had provided me with just the transcript. Uh, it was typed. And when did you discuss this with Mr. Walgren? Objection Bay. Did, you, dis did yes. you discuss page 62 with Mr. Walgren? Um, Not specifically, this was part of my uh, review of the case. But did you, did you discuss specifically that page with Mr. Walgren? I think it may have been part of our discussions. Uh, Thank you. Now, when a person has a cardiopulmonary arrest, time is of the essence, isn't it? That's correct. And the cardiopulmonary arrest is what you think occurred in this case. Is that correct? Um, I think the sequence that is most likely um, is that he had uh, a, a respiratory arrest, meaning he stopped breathing, and that ultimately culminated in cardiac arrest. And, and the reason I say that is because... Um, uh, Dr. Mary, in his interview, stated that when he found uh, Mr. There's Jack no question pending, oh. Doctor. You don't think he had a cardiopulmonary arrest? I, I do. I do. I'm just, I'm just trying to elaborate on uh, how I believe the, uh, the event occurred. I think that is, uh, that's more of a kind of a generic term. I'm trying to explain how the, the, the process occurred. Well, on page three, of your report, you used the term Jackson's cardiopulmonary arrest, didn't you? That's correct. Okay. That, that is the ultimate culmination when there is both absence of breathing or ventilation as well as absence of, of pulse and of blood pressure. Now, if we were to assume hypothetically that this occurred 
around 12 o'clock or just before. What's the first thing Dr. Murray should have done? Is I'm the, sorry, I, I'm confused. When you say this occurred, are you talking about the cardiopulmonary arrest? Um, Do you have to segment them? Or can you answer the question? No, I think I can answer a question. I think the first thing to have done in the situation he was in where he had lack of tools um, that are required is to call for help. That is the most important thing that he should have done is to call for help. So it, it, um, would, it would be your testimony that if the doctor walks in, sees the bed, sees the patient on the bed, not breathing, you think that he should, at that point in time, rather than tend to any, spend any time with the patient, go get help? You know, he, he made an assessment. I mean, that is, you know, the making the assessment was observing his color, how well his tissues were perfused, feeling for a pulse, which was around 122 and thready, and, and making a determination. And the first thing to do in that situation, I mean, that... That is a given. That is how you determine uh, what was happening, is to basically address the, the airway problem. The fact that he wasn't breathing is to basically extend the head, do a jaw thrust to try to open the airway. And given the limited resources, or really the lack of resources he had, was to call for help at that point. Okay, so you're going to allocate him the time to make the assessment that he's not breathing, determine whether he's got a pulse, and perhaps try to ventilate him. I mean, that, that is done instantaneously. I mean, this, that is done, this is not a, a process that, uh, I mean, you, when you're assessing someone that's down and, and, and in, in a critical situation, you make that determination immediately. Does, does he need to touch him? Yes. Does he need to manipulate him in any way? Manipulating uh, the airway and doing a jaw thrust is is really it takes less than less than seconds. So uh, those things are done when, as the as you're assessing the patient, but understanding that you have no resources and ultimately what is going to help save the patient is getting help. I think it's incumbent to first call for help. Well, he does have some resources, doesn't he? Um, what are you referring to? He is a doctor. He's, he's got skill and training. Sustained. Uh, no, no evidence of that he's a doctor. I think you're going to have to rephrase the question. Okay. I don't know what what it means in the context of resources. Okay. Well. There are things that you can do when you see a person not breathing that don't require apparatus. Is that correct? Um, that is correct, yeah. For example, if you, if you saw me fall over and I'm not breathing, well, you probably wouldn't want to do anything, but if that were to occur, would you immediately go for help, or would you try to maybe do CPR, ventilation? I would first make that initial assessment. Someone can be down. Uh, you know, they could have had a seizure. You, you make that initial assessment just to the, the, the very basic assessment of the patient. And if you are not in a hospital and you're not in an area where you have resources, you, first thing to do is to call 911. I mean, that is really very fundamental. Well, say you were, in, say that I collapsed, I'm not breathing, and you make that note, you feel for a pulse. Would you, as a doctor, mm -hmm. would you go? Pick up the phone and call 911, or would you assign that to maybe someone else? I think if there is somebody around, the first rule is to have that person 
call them. But if you are alone and there is nobody and you don't have the resources, you have to call 911 yourself right away. What if someone's in the next room? Um, you can call out for that person, and if there is an immediate response, um, that, that would seem reasonable. And you would be reasonable to tell that person that you, you need help and uh, to, to get security? No. If security theoretically is within a matter of less than a minute, 30 seconds away from your position there to this door in the back of the courtroom, no. you, you wouldn't go that far to get security? No, I would, I would want 911 called. Security is, is not going to provide any additive help to what I'm capable of doing, but the resources through the paramedics and the fire department are. So you, you don't think that the designation of someone else to get help while you tend to the patient would be appropriate? No, a designation for them to call 911, not to just inform them to come or, or just to let them know. The designation for that person or individuals to immediately call 911. That is what I'm referring okay. to as being appropriate. Do you know anything about the security arrangements at the Jackson House? I'm not aware of those details. Do you know that there was a front gate that's locked? Um, I've, I've heard that, but I'm, I'm not very, you know, I, I don't know the exact details. Are of you the aware of the fact that nobody gets in that front deck gate without security letting them in? Jackson, Your Honor, 352. I'm going to sustain the objection of your 352. Okay. Uh, How long would you spend on the phone with 911 before you went back to the patient? Um, I think most of us that have ever encountered calling 911, you, you would understand that it's it's really seconds. I mean, when you call 911, it's not like you're putting put on a voice recorder and put on hold. It is it, it, it is immediate. Uh, well, when you when you're using a cell phone. Is it as immediate as when you're using a landline? Do you know? I'm not sure what you're... Okay. Are, are you aware of the fact that... Uh, vague, beyond this area, his area of expertise. I'll overrule the objection. You don't know? I'm not, no. I, I don't okay. know what you're referring to. You, are you aware of the fact there was no landlines at the Jackson House? I, I, I did read that in the notes, yes. Do you know whether that's a complicating factor in calling 911? I think uh, if you have a cell phone around, uh, you can dial 911 through your cell phone. Okay. Do you, did you hear that the, the person that did call 911, it took them two minutes and 43 seconds Objection. on that phone call? To make the phone call? I object to the Sustain. You, the, the 911 call that was made, are you aware of the fact that it was two minutes and 43 seconds? In um, I, I'm just done. Overall. You know, there, I don't know if it was that period of time having the discussion about the details of the circumstance, but when you call 911, you, you speak to someone that actually can assist you and guide you, but what they do Im initially, immediately, is prompt that call for paramedics to get there. And in this case, if you, if you recall, paramedics got there within by, in six minutes. So it, it's, you can potentially be on a call longer, because unfortunately I've been in that circumstance myself, but the, 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 the call that's initiated to the fire department and paramedics, that happens instantaneously. So I think um, th there's different ways to look at what you're, you're asking. Is it your position that even if Michael Jackson 
self-medicated with excessive amounts of lorazepam. And Bolas pushed 25 milligrams of propofol. The Dr. Murray is still responsible for his death. Absolutely. Would you think a doctor that prescribed a patient 30 Ambien and the patient took them all and killed himself, that the doctor would be responsible? Definitely Nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Flanagan, thank you. Redirect examination by the people. Mr. Walgren. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Dr. Kamengard, let's, I want to follow up on Mr. Flanagan's hypothetical where, in which Mr. Flanagan fell to the floor and had some type of arrest right here, okay? Now, as a qualified medical doctor, if Mr. Flanagan fell to this floor, you would not wait 12 minutes and then call... Mr. Flanagan's legal secretary and then tell that legal secretary to send a law clerk upstairs to assist with Mr. Flanagan who's dying on the floor, would you? I don't think that's a proper hypothetical. Well, is there an objection? Yes. Sustained. You may rephrase. Would you wait 12 minutes uh, to call? Uh, let me just ask you. You would call 911 immediately because you would know you were lacking the uh, emergency equipment and everything that was necessary to save uh, the individual's life, correct? That's absolutely correct. And that not only is that a, a moral and professional obligation, it's basic common sense, isn't it? That's absolutely right. I mean, that is putting your patient first. Now, you had uh, been asked about dehydration. I think you wanted to elaborate on something regarding uh, Dr. Murray saying that uh, he had given saline for dehydration. What was it that you wished to elaborate right. on? Right. I was just, what I was trying to say was that uh, I, I did read that in the transcript. But all, the objection is overruled. Please. That he mentioned that as being a problem when he um, was, uh, was interviewed by the staff at UCLA Medical Center that, uh, that asked about what was going on with him. So I think there was that persistent concern even at that point. Okay. Thank you. And regarding Dr. Klein's uh, medical records, those were provided to you by me, correct? So you could review them? That's right. All right. And in those records, uh, what, you reviewed the records uh, for the months preceding uh, Mr. Jackson's death? That's right. All right. And in Dr. Murray's uh, interview with the police, he mentions on multiple occasions uh, that he was personally fully aware of Dr. Klein, and he knew at least three weeks prior to Michael's death he was aware that uh, Michael Jackson was seeing Dr. Klein, correct? That is correct. Now, the sleep article that Mr. Flanagan was referring to, that's from 2010, and it was out of uh, a, an experiment in China, correct? That's right. Okay, and you've, uh, I think you were very clear earlier specifying the differences, and that was uh, an experiment in a hospital setting to see if in the future propofol could have any uh, uh, effect in treating a specific type of insomnia, refractory insomnia. In a very highly monitored type of setting, using a very precise drip over a period of time like they did in the study over two hours. And again, even the authors of that study indicated it was a simply an experiment and that future study would need to be done. That's correct. So what Dr. Murray was doing with Michael with his treatment uh, with propofol to treat insomnia, truly, uh, Michael Jackson was being subjected to an experiment uh, by Dr. Murray. Yes, without the appropriate precautions. And there, again, there was no uh, diagnostic workup. There was no lab work. There was no history. There was no pharmaceutical history. So uh, from the records you reviewed, uh, Dr. Murray had no idea not only if Michael Jackson truly had insomnia, uh, but even what type of insomnia. That's right. I want to ask you a little bit about the uh, doctor-patient relationship. That is a unique, special relationship between a doctor and a patient, is it not? That is correct. Can you describe uh, fundamental tenets of uh, 
that forms the basis of a doctor-patient relationship? Well, I think the most important thing is putting your patient first. Uh, that is really when we, when we describe the Hippocratic Oath, the kind of the ethical moral standards that doctors uh, really have to abide by is really putting your patient first and doing what's right for them. Knowing your limitations, knowing when something is beyond the scope of your practice, knowing that some things that patients may ask for may not be in their best interest, and knowing when to say no. And knowing when to say no. In this case, specific to this case, if we assume is true that Michael Jackson uh, requested that he be given propofol, and you as a qualified doctor knows that that is not only uh, inappropriate but life-threatening, you have a professional, moral, and ethical obligation to say no, correct? That's absolutely right. No matter how much the patient may complain, no matter how much the patient may beg, you as the doctor have the obligation to say no. That is absolutely right. And who makes the final decision uh, when deciding what is appropriate care, the patient or the doctor? Your Honor, could I ask uh, Dr. White to please sit down? It's kind of distracting to... If we would, please. Thank you. Who makes the final decision as to the appropriate care uh, the patient or the doctor? It's the doctor. I mean, again, your patient's welfare is first and foremost. Now, Mr. Flanagan was asking you about the record keeping and, and uh, Dr. Murray's ability to recall important uh, facts or inability to recall important facts. And you, you uh, reiterated that the, the, you need to have the record so that you can uh, accurately ascertain the treatment and also accurately uh, detect trends. In other words, maybe a trend in a decreasing or increasing blood pressure or an increasing or decreasing oxygen saturation, correct? Correct. Okay. Particularly a decreasing oxygen saturation. And in uh, the defendant's interview, um, there's a perfect example, is there not, about his inability to give precise information uh, as it relates to the oxygen saturation. That is correct. And on page 63, line 9, Dr. Murray indicates uh, that prior to leaving his patient for what he said was two minutes, he indicates, quote, I monitored, saw his oxygen saturation. It was in the high 90s, comma, 90 percent. High 90s and 90 percent in the medical world are profoundly different numbers, are they not? That's, that's very, very correct. I mean, if you're starting off with a with an oxygen saturation of 99 or 100 percent, and then soon after your oxygen saturation is 90 percent. That is a very troubling trend, and that is, again, goes to why it's important to have these records. We're just not doing it to make life difficult for, for ourselves and for nursing staff. We do it for these reasons, so that we are able to follow trends and know when they're warning signs. Okay, and from his statement here, it was in the high 90s, comma, 90 percent, there's really no way to know which number he's referring to. That's right. And there are no records to look at to determine what the vitals were and to determine what that saturation level was. That's correct. Now, you were also asked uh, by Mr. Flanagan in a hypothetical sense, uh, <coughs> you know, could a, could a doctor be grossly negligent and the patient survive? Do you remember that? Uh, right. Okay. A doctor could be grossly negligent on a certain factor uh, and... God willing, a patient could survive, correct? That's right. Okay. In this case, I want to talk about this case. Uh, Conrad Murray was grossly negligent in multiple instances, and that gross negligence directly caused the death of Michael Jackson, correct? Absolutely did, yes. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Mr. Walvin, thank you. Recross, do you need a moment, Mr. Flanagan? If you'd like, do you need a moment? I'm Okay. All right, thank you. We cross by the defense. You're aware that when Dr. Murray discovered Michael Jackson, he immediately performed CPR. 
section per comment or statement. Is that the prefatory phrase? I think that's all the information he has, Your Honor. I think. <coughs> well, why don't you re-ask the question, please? Sustain. Pursuant to his statement, he immediately performed CPR, didn't he? Yes. And you think that's wrong? He shouldn't have done that. I think he should have called for help. And then, prior to calling Michael Amir, were you aware of the fact that he went partially down the stairs and called for help? I did read that in the, in the statement, yes. But he did not ask the, the, the chef to call 911. Asking for help, um, let me reiterate because I mentioned the word myself, it should be call 911. Help could be anyone. It could be one of his kids. They can't do the appropriate things that are necessary that paramedics and the fire department can do. So it is critical to ask for them to call 911. Were you aware that he asked the chef to get security? That's what I read in the statement, yes. And you, you quarrel with the fact that you think it's wrong to assign the 911 logistics to security Objection. and get back to your patient. Objection. It assumes facts not in evidence. Sustained. Do you think it's wrong to call security with the intention that you're going to turn that task over to security and that you're going to get back to your patient? Objection. It assumes facts not in evidence. Sustained. If you are of the opinion that security can come immediately, do you think it's wrong to have a state of mind where you're going to ask them to call 911? Objection. Speculation assumes facts not in evidence. Irrelevant. Sustained. Were you aware of the fact that the chef who was asked to call security did not call security? Objection. Relevance to this Overall. witness. Um, I'm not exactly sure about those details about exactly what was done there. And are you aware that the, the call to Mr. Williams, who was in charge of all the security and all the employees at the house was done a significant time after that he had already asked the chef to get security. Were you aware of that? Um, I understand there was a period of six to seven minutes after that, perhaps, based on the testimony. Were you aware of the fact that when security walked into his bedroom, where Michael Jackson was, that the very first thing he said was, we need an ambulance? Jackson assumes facts not in evidence. A rule. I don't recall that precise statement. Okay. Nothing further. Mr. Lanigan, thank you. We redirect Mr. Walgan. Question, Your Honor. Dr. Kamagar, just so the record's clear, in all your previous references to the need for the doctor to call for help, uh, you were specifically re stating the doctor needs to call 911 because the doctor knows he does not have the resources to save this individual's life. Right. Or if there's somebody that is immediately available asking that person to call 911. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Walgan, thank you. We recross, Mr. Flanagan. What do you mean by immediately available? Someone that is in, in the room, that's present, uh, that's in, in the room. You gave the hypothetical question, let's say, uh, that if something happened to you, if there was only Mr. Walgren in the room and myself, I would ask Mr. Walgren to uh, call 911. What if there was someone in the hallway? Would you ask them? I would 
have a shout out uh, and shout out help, help, and that's the first thing you do. And if I don't get an immediate response within seconds, no, then that means I'm alone and I'm responsible for calling 911. So if Dr. Murray was go part way down the stairs and shout out for help, that wouldn't be adequate to you? No, I think you should have called 911 right away. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Walgren? No, thank you. May Dr. Kamengar be excused. Mr. Walgren. Yes, please. Mr. Planigan? Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Kamengar, thank, thank you for your testimony, sir. Please uh, don't discuss your testimony or the facts of the case with any other witnesses until we finish the trial. You may step down and leave, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walgren, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. People would call Dr. Uh, Stephen 